This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Is your son or daughter graduating high school soon? Are you trying to persuade him or her not to major in the liberal arts? Coming up, we look at whether a degree from a liberal arts college impacts your child's chances to find a job. Goldie Blumenstick, senior writer from the Chronicle for Higher Education, will join us to talk about how some colleges are rethinking their programs to make sure graduates have skills that match today's workforce needs. Now, here in Connecticut, tech giant Infosys has opened a hub in Hartford as part of a promise to hire 10,000 American workers in six regions by this summer. But what skills is Infosys looking for? You may be surprised to hear the global company is training and hiring liberal arts graduates. Today where we live, we look at the initiative and why Emphasis has partnered with Trinity College in Hartford. Uh, joining us from NPR's New York City studios are, is Ravi Kumar. He's president at Infosys, which is a global IT company. It started in India and now it's all over the world and uh, looking to expand here in the United States. Ravi, welcome to our show. Thank you, Lucy, for this opportunity. Also in studio with me is President Joanne Berger-Sweeney. Uh, she's president of Trinity College in Hartford. Joanne, welcome to our show as well. It's terrific to be here, Lucy. So, Ravi, uh, people in Connecticut are becoming more and more familiar with the name Infosys because of your company's uh, commitment to opening up a hub in downtown Hartford. But for uh, many of us who don't really know what Infosys does, tell us what your company uh, does, who your clients are. Thank you, Lucy, for that question. Uh, Infosys is a global uh, tech and uh, digital consulting firm working for the Fortune 500 and global 2,000 um, large enterprises. We uh, work in partnership with uh, the, uh, these enterprises to uh, digitize their landscapes and make them stay relevant uh, in an in a, in a age, in a digital age, which is rapidly changing the landscape of large enterprises. So I mentioned that uh, Emphasis now has um, uh, a footprint in downtown Hartford. Why did the company decide to bring this technology and innovation hub to Hartford? Yeah, you know, in May of 2017, um, as a part of a journey to uh, cater to our clients, we committed 10,000 American jobs. Uh, Digital technologies need need us to um, co-create and co-innovate with our clients. And we chose six regions in the United States where we would create tech and innovation hubs. Hartford is one of them where we committed 1,000 jobs in March of 2018. In December, we opened the hub, and uh, guess what? Uh, in literally five months, we have uh, already crossed 400 jobs in, uh, in, the, mm-hmm. in, the, in the state of Connecticut through our Hartford hub. Um, Liberal arts is a very important initiative for us nationally in the United States, and we have partnered with the Trinity College to uh, develop a curriculum on liberal arts in the digital age and actually deliver to that curriculum by hiring uh, nationally liberal arts graduates and training them in conjunction with the Trinity College. So when you're talking about uh, the new hires uh, that Emphasis has committed uh, to finding in the United States, let's look. Let's talk about uh, the thousand here in Connecticut. So what skills are you looking for? What kind of jobs are they filling, Ravi? Yeah, you know that's a great question, Lucy. You know, um, on one side of the spectrum, you need deep programming to develop new age digital software like uh, AI, machine learning. Uh, artificial, you know, um, aut- autonomous technologies, and a variety of new age digital technologies. On the other side, uh, other side of the spectrum, you need liberal arts um, capabilities. It's fascinating to know that um, digital technologies will leverage liberal arts, and the reason being, it's very simple. You know, in the age of digital, you're going to move from a from a straight line of higher education to learning to a continuum of learning. And uh, you need to be a lifelong learner. And to be a lifelong learner, you need to learn to learn. And I think liberal arts is one of those fascinating uh, spaces where you you uh, teach students how to be a lifelong learner. You know, I I, I call this a fascinating uh, a fascinating shift from T skills to Z skills. You know, T skills of the past where you needed a specialization and a, and a, and a, uh, and a exposure to a breadth of uh, a breadth of capabilities. 
I call this the Z skills because you have to learn to learn, you have to learn to unlearn, and then you have to learn to learn again in a constantly changing digital age where you need to be a lifelong learner. Mm. So liberal arts gives you that brilliant opportunity to, um, to absorb students who can actually learn to learn, learn to unlearn, and learn to learn on a continual basis, lifelong learning. So, Ravi, uh, uh, emphasis has been around for some time. Uh, when did this shift to looking for liberal arts graduates uh, really start to take effect because we're seeing the digital, digital technology changing uh, rapidly? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. We, uh, you know, I have to say that this is a very pioneering experiment with the Trinity mm-hmm. College. We did not hire liberal arts graduates in the past. Um, Lucy, you know, the, the di- digital technology by itself is important, but uh, what is more important is to apply that technology to businesses. Applying technol- new age digital technologies to businesses is a bigger virtue than the technology itself. Mm-hmm. And um, we kind of built a joint curriculum with the Trinity College, thanks to Juan and her leadership team, which helped us to conceptualize. We have a 12-week program where we build data scientists, uh, industry analysts, digital consultants, design uh, design consultants. You know, experience of design is such an important aspect of the digital economy. In fact, new age digital companies are born and built based on experience gaps left by large enterprises. So we do believe that uh, design has to be inspired by liberal arts. So these curriculums, these pathways from data scientists to analysts to design consultants to experienced design consultants, those pathways are the ones we are experimenting with uh, with the Trinity College and we hire nationally liberal arts graduates and we train them for 12 weeks before they start productive work. And in these 12 weeks, they are a part of the Infosys family, but they're jointly trained by Trinity Mm -hmm. and Infosys. Um, The first batch is already out. Uh, We had the first batch of 27 um, graduates who passed this course, uh, the 12 week finishing school, as I call it. (laughs) And, um, and they they are they are already uh, they are already doing productive work uh, at Infosys, and we are now going to repeat this exercise, um, uh, you know, month on month, and um, and continue to find more pathways. Mm. Um, to continue this embrace of liberal arts in the digital mm-hmm. age. Ravi Kumar is joining us, president at Infosys, uh, joining us from NPR's New York studio as we learn more about this uh, partnership, as Ravi mentioned, with Trinity College to uh, both train and hire liberal arts graduates. That partnership is with Trinity College in Hartford. Uh, president Joanne Berger Sweeney's in studio with me. Uh, so, how did this partnership get started? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think when we first heard that Infosys might come to the Hartford area. There were two things on my mind. One, what a great place for our students who graduate. You know, so my first thought was about um, hiring our students, the students we produce, and giving them jobs in digital technology. And then After speaking with Ravi and so many people in his organization, it became clear this could be so much broader than just a place where Trinity College students could work, but really a proof of concept that liberal arts graduates could make the transition into digital technology jobs in the future. Before this partnership, Joanne, would a Trinity grad even think about digital tech? Probably not. And that is the kind of bridge we're trying to build. We're trying to expand the minds of our liberal arts graduates to help them share how they can use the skills and analysis that they've learned in the liberal arts and take it to fields 
very, very broadly after they graduate. You know, something that we've talked about before on the show, and, you know, it was just uh, in circles when we think about higher education, uh, what skills graduates, mm-hmm. no matter what school they go to, are leaving with, and the fact that right. uh, they don't want to end up uh, unemployed or underemployed. Is that something that you were hearing from your alumni base that, or even from your current students, that they're worried that once uh, they get their diploma, um, what's the next step in the fact that they're spending or their parents are spending right. lots of money to exactly. get that degree. Exactly. And there's no question that people wonder from the moment they walk into college, what am I going to do afterwards? But what we try and remind people, it's not just what that first job is, but they are probably going to have seven, eight, ten jobs in their career. So what we're trying to do is to prepare them to succeed for life, not just for their first job. So we care about critical thinking, analysis. They're learning about leadership, communication, working as a team. And I think most importantly, we are training problem finders, not just problem solvers. Uh, We got a tweet from Christina uh, who said she learned invaluable skills with her degree from Central Connecticut State University, a history Mm -hmm. degree. And she writes, digital tech is the future of the history major. Uh, Ravi Kumar, uh, what do you think about that response from one of our listeners? No, that's a that's a great question. Uh, You know, um, any discipline which is non-STEM, you know, be it humanity, uh, history, anthropology, psychology and a variety of them. And the and the confluence of all of these in a in a in a in a liberal arts framework, which gives you cross disciplinary um, thinking or anti disciplinary thinking, as I call it. You know, it's a very interesting interesting uh, term. I call it anti disciplinary, which is almost on the other side of the spectrum. Gives us a phenomenal perspective to apply technology to businesses, apply digital technologies to businesses. I did mention. The virtue of applying these technologies is a much bigger virtue than the technology itself. History, um, by by it means by all means, gives you a context of the changing uh, world, you know, in the past, and it gives you a perspective of how human behavior, how human culture has evolved over the historic times of uh, of uh, of the past. And if you can apply back, apply that back to um to to how you how you drive the embrace of technology to businesses um you know uh, it it really helps so i would say anything which is non stem but does give an opportunity to be a lifelong learner as mm-hmm. joanne mentioned and one well, another important thing is problem finding you know uh, problem finding is a much much bigger virtue than problem solving on on one side of the spectrum you have problem solvers on the other side of the spectrum you have problem finders uh, one of the things lucy i've been researching on the future of work the future of work is going to move from humans private human capital to private human capital plus public human capital which is uh, primarily the gig economy with machines. Machines become really problem solvers and the private human capital focuses on the creative part of jobs. Mm-hmm. So I would say creative part of jobs will come from an embrace of mm-hmm. liberal arts, uh, which kind of orients you to critical thinking and problem finding and history is one of those disciplines which kind of fits in there. Uh, coming up, we're going to hear more ex- about this Uh, exactly what uh, uh, Trinity grads and other liberal arts grads are learning in this unique partnership. That's in a little bit. But I did want to ask you, Ravi, um, again, this is a a partnership uh, with Trinity College, but what about partnering with a state university or even a community college? I believe Emphasis has partnered with a a Rhode Island community college. Um, Is that also in in the works uh, for uh, trying to find uh, well-rounded individuals to to, to get a job in the digital technology? Yeah, so Lucy, let me clarify this. Uh, the Trinity College partnership with Infosys is a national partnership for liberal arts, and thanks to Juan and the leadership team, which has helped us to evolve it. Uh, but we are going to hire from all colleges across the nation, including uh, the universities at Connecticut. 
One of the reasons why we set up the hub in Hartford is because we knew that the academic ecosystem in Connecticut is um, is what we want to tap into. Unlike other employers in the tech space who focus on hiring from the market, we focus on hiring from schools, training them on our finishing school infrastructure, like the Trinity College infrastructure. We have other other streams and then making them productive with the workforce. And that's why we are such an important and such a unique employer. Um, community colleges is, is, a, is a new experiment for us again. We believe in the digital age, uh, the world is going to move from higher education to skills. And when that switch happens, uh, you would need more embrace of community colleges. You know, 50% of the students in the United States go to community colleges and uh, it is um, it is um, it is I, it is an irony that very few employers go to community colleges to hire. So we are kind of creating an experiment now to get community colleges as a part of the digital embrace. Um, I, I want to leave one final thought here in the future of the future of digital um, will blur the lines between white collar and blue collar jobs. I call them the new collar jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the embrace of digital is so, so pervasive that every industry, every function, every role and every job is going to change. And uh, and therefore, we think community colleges will be a very, very important constituent. So we're doing a similar finishing school with CCRI, the Community College of Rhode Island. But that's, again, a national experiment. We're going to hire from community colleges across the United States, including the state mm-hmm. of Connecticut. So, Joanne, uh, before we uh, end the SEG, um, Robbie mentioned the first cohort uh, finished up, the second cohort of liberal arts grads starting uh, this month. Uh, so this experiment, what is right. Trinity College learning in sense of going beyond uh, this just partnership with Emphasis, but right. thinking about uh, providing these types of skills uh, across the board, not right. just to this the, the grads in this particular program? Exactly. So something that's really quite interesting about the future. One thing I want to share is the Department of Labor suggests that more than 50 percent of the jobs in the future do not currently exist. Right. So we're training people for jobs that we don't even know in the future, which means that broad base of analytical skills, being able to find the next problem is absolutely critical. We understand the importance of that. So that's one reason why we, you know, engaged in this partnership with Emphasis. But the second thing that you're suggesting is we also know that the demographics of the United States are such that 18 to 20-year-olds, 18 to 22-year-olds are decreasing as a proportion of the population, which means if we care about learning and training, We need to expand beyond that age group and think about training and retraining of people. And so this partnership with Infosys is allowing us to think beyond kind of just the liberal arts 18 to 22-year-olds on campus and think about training and retraining of people that needs to happen throughout their lifetime. And we want to be a part of that. Uh, Joanne Berger-Sweeney, again, is president of Trinity College. Uh, with us from NPR's New York studio, Ravi Kumar, president at Infosys. This is a global IT company that opened up an innovation hub in downtown Hartford. Uh, Ravi, before you go, uh, you know, Connecticut has had some bumps in the road attracting businesses to the state, and then they left. Uh, residents are, um, you know, uh, skeptical of the state when they offer incentives to companies like yours. What is your commitment to the state of Connecticut? How long will you stay here? Oh, we're going to stay for good. Um, we committed a thousand jobs. Um, we're ahead of the schedule by hiring 400 in the first uh, few months of our uh, presence in Connecticut. Um, we are very happy with um, the state government, the local academic institutions, and our own um, our own local brand to attract talent not just from the state of Connecticut but from other neighboring and adjacent states. Um, so we are super excited. I would say, uh, as I said, we are a very unique employer. We were not looking for the tech talent available in the local market. We were looking for the academic institutions in the state and what can they offer to us. And um, 
you know, um, whatever we we kind of conceptualized and forecasted, uh, we are very, very happy with the progress we have made. Well, Ravi Kumar, we thank you for joining us today here on Where We Live. Thank you so much, Lucy, for this opportunity. Thanks, Joanne, for the partnership. And as as always, inspiring us with uh, with all your um, all your exceptional thought leadership in liberal arts. I I always go away learning something from Joanne. Always, <laughs> I would say the same is true with me and Ravi. Thank, Thank you, you Joanne, so much for coming in. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. So coming up, we're going to learn more about how exactly Emphasis is working with these liberal arts graduates. Uh, you know, what are they learning exactly for these uh, jobs of tomorrow? And later, will more liberal arts colleges adjust their programs across the country to help graduates? find these jobs. What's your take? Were you happy that you were a liberal arts grad? Join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, what skills do college students need to have today to find a job after graduation? We'll talk to a senior writer at the Chronicle for Higher Education about that question and learn how some liberal arts programs are thinking more about how to make their graduates more employable. Now, here in Connecticut, we're learning about Emphasis, a tech company, and its partnership with Trinity College to help train liberal arts graduates for digital tech jobs. So how are they doing that exactly? Joining me now in studio is Jeff Auker, Associate Vice President at Infosys and leader of the company's new Hartford Technology and Innovation Hub. Jeff, welcome to our show. Thank you, Lucy. Glad to be here. Also with us is a recent Trinity grad who is now working as a business analyst at the Infosys Hartford Hub, Wilfred Ganyak Tenshu. Wilfred, thank you for coming in. Thank you uh, for having me, Lucy. The pleasure is truly mine. So we heard from uh, Ravi Kumar uh, and Joanne Berger Sweeney about uh, what led to the partnership. But Jeff, you're really the one on the ground uh, helping train these new liberal arts graduates. So how are you doing that, and what kind of jobs are they filling? Well, fundamentally, the digital transformations that Joanna and Ravi talked about at the beginning are about creating experiences. Mm -hmm. Right. Putting something in your hand, putting something online that solves a problem for you, opens up an opportunity. And that requires somebody in the mix to really understand that end user. And what you're talking about there is the context. Uh, take healthcare, for instance, where I spent the last eight years. Mm-hmm. Healthcare in America is really difficult to understand. Right. The experiences range from, you know, are all over the board. And so if you're trying to create, say, an application, uh, a website, something, some digital experience that would help you, it re- you really need somebody in the mix that understands the journey, the context, the people that you're serving. And liberal arts is all about understanding other people's experiences, enriching yourself, understanding context. And so what we're really trying to create are people that can be the champion of that experience, the steward of that experience. Because really what you're doing in digital is making the customer kind of the hero of their own story. Mm. So there's no shortage of people with STEM skills, but you're looking beyond that uh, to help communicate between the company and the client with whatever, uh, I guess, they're looking for in terms of the services that they're paying for. Exactly. Um, you know, we can train people to code. Uh, we, we are looking for the data scientists. Of course, we've got that piece. But fundamentally, an engineer, an analyst is about taking a big, hairy problem, breaking it down into small components that everybody can code, can solve for. But somebody has to be the steward of when you put that all back together, is that the experience? Is that the digital experience that you really wanted to create? And when you mix, say, like with Wilfred, the business analyst certification, right, the person that's sitting in between the business and the technologist um, putting the requirements together, understanding what you know, how, what we're going to build. When you mix that with the ways of working that are um, essential today, agile design thinking, that's part of the training. But we're also putting storytelling in there, bringing the liberal arts teachers in there to help um, provide a sense of context. So somebody like Wilfred will be the person uh, looking at the code, defining what experiences you're going to create, but also being the one that says, yeah, we nailed it. That's the experience that we wanted all along. Wilfred, did you ever think you'd be working for a digital tech company? Uh, No, I never had the idea um, to um, work for a technology company before. And so when the opportunity, first of all, I would like to say I'm very grateful um, to have been given the opportunity uh, to my boss and the team and uh, to Trinity College as well, too, for the training. And so this has been an amazing experience for me and this transition 
um, has been such a life learning or lifelong learning experience, as President uh, Kamara said, and also uh, this, uh, as my boss here mentioned, so we are uh, that pillar between the tech, the tech team and also the business team. So really being in the center of it is really um, an experience that I have few mm-hmm. words to explain. Uh, Jeff, uh, Douglas on Twitter uh, writes, Trinity is now among the five most expensive colleges in the country. What kind of starting salary can an Infosys hire expect? People always want to know about the money. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it varies. It varies. Mm-hmm. But we are looking to be as competitive as possible. You know, we're looking to get people like Wilfred that are excited. We're looking to keep them. So um, the package is competitive, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I should mention we're talking about the importance of, of having a, a liberal arts background. That's something that, that's where you come from, Jeff. Indeed. I have my philosophy PhD, <laughs> and they're letting me run the place. <laughs> and so how did you uh, make that transition? So back in the 90s um, at Brown, we were creating programs um, that for the first time we were teaching online. We had some partnerships with uh, schools around the country. Um, we were moving curricula online. We were doing you know, video conferences. So we were using the Internet in what at the time was, was pretty novel ways. Also at the time, I was tending bar to get my way through school. And we started opening some bars and we started advertising online. So it was difficult to make a living in academia in the 90s. And I made a decision to uh, move into technology. And at the time, I knew about as much about the Internet as anybody and uh, did some startup work and uh, back in the Bay Area and then moved back here to Hartford to start a family and had an opportunity at the Hartford to work in their innovation group. And that led into a bunch of digital roles. And here I am. Uh, we heard Ravi Kumar talk about automation, uh, AI, and some of that means that the, the uh, skills of the past that uh, you know humans uh, mm-hmm. were doing uh, will be taken over by robots, uh, so to speak. But in the same sense, uh, what is Infosys and other companies when they're looking at uh, the jobs of tomorrow, what are some of the skills that are robot-proof, so to speak? Critical thinking, understanding the other humans. I mean, the robots, are, this is going to sound kind of weird, but they're still serving the humans, right? Um, there are ethical questions that come up um, when you deploy some of these technologies. There's the experiences that I was talking about earlier. All of those are in service to making people's lives better. And if we lose contact with those people we're serving, um, we're, not, we're not doing anything good. So the critical thinking, um, the, the empathy, the ability to collaborate, work with other people, um, all of those wrap around some key technical skills, which we'll train you up on. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the communication, collaboration, the empathy with other humans and what you're trying to build, but what you're also trying to avoid um, is going to be that that's what's going to future proof mm-hmm. you. Oh, Wilfred, take us into the uh, the training that you received. What were the skills that you didn't have with your Trinity uh, degree that you're about to receive? So congratulations on that. Thank but you. What are some of the things that you had to learn in this 12 week program? So um, before I transition straight to the answer, I would like to say as well, as uh, uh, Dr. Sweeney mentioned, we are not just problem solvers, but also problem finders. And so really now I am applying those skills to now learn about um, like different, different programming languages and just on the path of becoming a data scientist, for instance. So th- those are the things that I never thought of and never thought this will be something possible. Um, so really that transition, translating from my background to now the technology ward at the Infosys family. So definitely this is uh, one experience that I I would like for any uh, listeners to be inspired and to know that it is possible that our uh, willingness could take, uh, could take us very far. Uh, it's you know again it's great to hear that uh, these liberal arts grads are learning these types of skills for these for an industry that is uh, constantly changing Jeff but you're also putting a lot of investment into uh, these future workers mm-hmm. and we know here in Connecticut you know the narrative is we can't hold on to young people because they're trained up and then they go to work somewhere else say Boston so mm-hmm. how do you uh, handle that challenge well this is actually surprising we first started looking at the the 400 jobs that, that Ravi mentioned we've created here, over 60% of those are people coming in from out of state. And I double-checked that. I walked around. I talked to the people that were coming in. Um, we're finding that, you know, it, 
the old narrative was you you know you go to a leafy college here in Connecticut, go to the big city, and then maybe come back here in your 30s to raise a family. Um, that was fine when people could have ten bucks and go to New York and figure it out. Mm-hmm. But student debt is is making that sort of approach very a lot more difficult for other people, for especially the college graduates. So we're seeing uh, a strong willingness to look at cities where the cost of living is reasonable. Um, also uh, going against that grain. When we're offering these jobs, when we're offering the training, we're seeing a large influx of folks in their mid-late 20s coming back to Connecticut if the opportunity is there. So that narrative, um, we're, we're breaking it a little bit. I think it's the, the opportunity, the, you know, the, the type of job, the type of you know, things that Wilfred is talking about where you're getting skills that, that are explicitly being trained to be future-proof. We're bringing people back. Mm. Wilfred, where did you grow up and, you know, what are your uh, what are your plans? You, do you think that Connecticut's a, a good place for you at this time of your life? Uh, um, yes, I grew up in um, Cameroon and in other countries. I've been to several countries as well. But um, yes, Connecticut, I definitely think Hartford in particular um, is a city where I would like to um, stay for a very long time. And if opportunity allows, um, have have a family and um, just continue to. Uh, Give, I guess, give back to the community and continue to uh, apply the skills that I will learn in the future and the ones that I'm learning at Trinity uh, Infosys now. Uh, this is where we live. Uh, in studio with me, Wilfred Ganyak Tenchu, a recent Trinity graduate who's now working as a business analyst at the Infosys Hartford Hub. With us also, Jeff Ocker, Associate Vice President at Infosys and leader of the uh, Infosys' new Hartford Technology and Innovation Hub. But we're learning about why the company has been reaching out to liberal arts graduates uh, to both train and hire them versus the traditional idea of a programmer, a software engineer, uh, someone with a lot more uh, STEM uh, skills that would be working in digital tech. Uh, you know, this is something that's new for Connecticut, Jeff, but when we think about a big I- big technology companies, mm-hmm. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, also looking for liberal arts graduates. There are people that are more, uh, more well-rounded and not so focused on, on one particular specialty. Yes. I think we're, as Ravi mentioned, um, we're on the leading edge. But if you, I think, uh, I don't want... You know, Apple, I know, has always been a big um, uh, consumer of the liberal arts. And you look at the design, you look at the experience that is so important to them, Google as well. So we, we do know that is out there. And um, But in this industry, um, I think what we're doing is pretty unique. Maggie uh, tweeted at us. Uh, she wrote, STEM company and it needs a lot of different skills. As a partner at a financial firm, we're often seeking interns that write well and have communication skills, especially as social media becomes ever more important to business. This is a place that liberal arts can really add value. Uh, so different companies are seeing the value of liberal arts graduates as well. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, it, again, digital is about experience. You've got to have people that understand mm-hmm. the people on the other end that mm-hmm. uh, they are going to be consuming the experiences yeah. you create. You mentioned that um, you've got 60 percent of new hires coming from out of Connecticut, but there's always the concern that there are people in the state who need jobs, who need training for, again, these uh, jobs of tomorrow. Uh, is that the next step for emphasis is figuring out ways to uh, train up the workforce that's here, that's willing to learn? Absolutely. Um, there's been, I mean, we're new. So, you know, we've, we've been open for a few months, um, but conversations with the Department of Labor, with the state and community colleges, uh, with the variety of training programs that exist in Connecticut, what can we do to help guide the curriculum, help guide the trainings that are being offered? Because by definition, we're looking for the skills that our clients are finding most valuable and frankly, the most rare. So as we look at these new tools like Angular and React and, you know, the Spring Stack and all this stuff, um, we are communicating, we are working with the community to figure out how we can tune the training out there to the jobs that are, that are the hottest around here. Mm-hmm. Well, we want to thank you for coming in to explain a little bit about this training program. Jeff Walker, again, uh, is the leader of Emphasis, a new Hartford Technology and Innovation Hub. Thanks so much for coming in today. No, thank you, Lucy. Thanks for having us. Also, Wilfred Ganyak Tenchu, a recent Trinity grad who says he's sticking around Connecticut. That's always good news to hear. Wilfred, thank you. Congratulations on your future degree. Thank you, Lucy. The pleasure was truly mine. And 
Thank you again. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanch. And on Coming Up, are other colleges working to blend their liberal arts programs with technical skills? Is that a good idea? What do you think? Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. We're going to hear from the senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education who's been looking at uh, this particular topic. And we hope to hear from you, too, right after the break. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Now, we just learned about a unique partnership between IT company Infosys and Trinity College in Hartford, where liberal arts graduates are being trained to work in digital technology. Now, nationwide, are other colleges and universities trying to do a better job of matching students with skills needed for jobs in today's workforce? Uh, joining me now to talk about that and more is uh, Goldie Blumenstick, senior writer for the Chronicle of Higher Education, author of American Higher Education in Crisis, What Everyone Needs to Know. Goldie, welcome to our show. Oh, oh, Goldie, are you there? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Welcome to our show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so I don't know if uh, you'd heard uh, my intro, but we really were curious about nationally uh, about the partnership between higher ed institutions and employers. We heard about a unique partnership here in Connecticut. Are you seeing that in uh, at other colleges and universities in the country? I'm seeing versions of that in various per- permutations, I would say. Um, in some cases, you know, down the road at um, Yale, actually, they've just made a partnership with a coding boot camp for sort of a summer intensive program in digital skills. Lots of other colleges are kind of creating skill um, programs like minors in digital skills training or even data science minors. So I think you are starting to see a little bit more of this around the country, particularly at um, general institutions. And the idea of doing this at a liberal arts college is is really really an important um, trend and a good one. Mm. Is there some pushback, though, when people think about uh, what a liberal arts education provides that um, now focusing on these practical or technical skills will take away from that? I feel like there is sometimes pushback. Personally, from after the more I study what, how colleges are doing it and if they're doing it smartly, I think the pushback is a little bit. Um, well, I can't. I can't say it's it, it's unnecessary because everyone sort of fights about the curriculum there. But if you think about what the role of a liberal arts education is, it's to sort of prepare um, people for the future, prepare people to learn how to learn. And if we're thinking about how much of our society, how much of our economy is going digital. To, not, to have a liberal arts education that doesn't include some training in digital skills, I think, is um, kind of Ill, really ill-advised. I think the future is digital, and I think you could add these digital skills to the curriculum without compromising everything about the liberal arts that we all love and value. Mm-hmm. I'm a liberal arts major myself. I, I, I come to it not just as a reporter on a subject, but with personal experience. Mm-hmm. I wanted to take some listener calls. Robert's mm-hmm. calling from Glastonbury. Robert, go ahead with your question. I have friends that have graduated with uh, engineering degrees and one that actually graduated with an engineering degree and a liberal arts degree, uh, both bachelors, but he bumps into the age discrimination where, you know, he has the skills. He's actually working for a company that works for Pratt Whitney, but Pratt Whitney won't hire him because he's 50. Hmm. So I know that they say, oh, we want the skills, but I think it's not just the skills. There's a, sometimes there's an age or, or a dollar rate that they kind of want, I think. And I don't think that uh, that's always addressed. Well, thank you, Robert, for that comment. Uh, Goldie Blumenstick, how do you respond to our listener uh, who talks about, again, uh, this idea of age discrimination? Um, are companies really looking for the skills or for uh, what they think are people that can adapt well? Unfortunately, what they're, <clears throat> what they're looking for is a lot of things, and in some cases they may also be looking to pay only a certain amount. And so if you're running up against a salary problem, that's a, it's going to be hard to um, make the skills argument I mean, what we've been hearing recently with the economy um, sort of still on the upswing is that when the skills are in demand, eventually people will pay for the pay the salaries that they'll need to to get these people in the jobs. But until that becomes a really big of a, big of a problem, unfortunately, employers will still do what employers need to do. They they want skills. What companies say that they want is they want people who are adaptable. You're right. They want people with the skills. They want people who can sort of problem solve and so some of this is, it's hard to, the problem is partly it's really hard to show some of that. You could get a degree that shows your, uh, you have the engineering expertise. A lot of times you don't have a piece of paper that can also say, P.S., expert mm-hmm. in problem-solving, communication, and, you know, empathy and creativity. So 
part of the problem is the way we the way the credential system works in our country right now. There aren't really good good ways of signaling some of those other traits. Uh, Goldie, in your reporting, uh, when we look at uh, people with uh, bachelor's degrees uh, who have gone to liberal arts uh, colleges, uh, their outcomes are still looking pretty good? They are, actually. Um, with a little twist, um, I call it this sort of a liberal arts plus. Increasingly, most of the studies I look at that talk about uh, employment outcomes for liberal arts grads, and these are based on real analyses of real data, not the anecdote about the barista in the coffee shop, but people who actually study resumes and job ads, uh, people who have a liberal arts degree and then maybe like one additional technical skill, maybe they've learned a little bit of programming, maybe they can really prove that they know how to work with data or even communicate data, maybe they know something about um, Tableau or some of these other tools that are really good display tools for communicating. Those are the graduates coming out of liberal arts colleges that have the best opportunities in the market right now. Peter's calling from New York. Peter, go ahead. Yes, uh, we work up in Harlem helping adults find jobs. And so we certainly face the questions of people that have started and stopped a few times. What's their place in in this whole scheme? They're often older. Uh, They've often bounced from job to job. Uh, Very smart, uh, ready to learn. Uh, But there's not a lot of programs that will take them in and give them any kind of income. So they get shuffled to security jobs, CVS, cash register jobs. They don't get put in this path. Well, thank you, Peter, uh, for uh, your question and comment. Uh, Goldie, uh, how do we respond to uh, the workforce uh, development issues of people that have lower education or are doing, uh, I guess, uh, quote-unquote, low-skilled jobs? Because those jobs of t- tomorrow that we're talking about, they don't get that training. Huge, huge problem. And I actually, it was very heartening to hear um, President Sweeney talk earlier about how Trinity is thinking about its role <clears throat> in a different way, even not just a traditional liberal arts college, but thinking about how it might at some point be doing more training for older students coming back into the workplace. Probably more colleges should be starting to think about that right now. There's, we, our country does not have a really organized workforce system. We, you know, we have school, we have community college, we have um, four-year colleges. We don't have a lot of really good systems sort of in the middle of that, you know, for people who aren't in college and need to go for training. A lot of it's on the private side or it's through employers and it's a it's a mixed bag right now, and I think that's a big gap in our system. Um, your caller is correct. There are, you know, through workforce boards and other organizations, there are ways to tap into some of these networks, some of these organizations, but there aren't enough of them. Mm. Uh, and the stakes are higher than ever before when we think about just the uh, sticker shock of sending a student uh, to an undergrad institution, uh, Trinity, $74,000 a year. Uh, you want to believe that when you get that degree that you're going to find a job to help pay off that student debt if you're not able to have a family that can afford to pay it for you, Goldie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're definitely I – mean, I, I think we're starting to see in a few smaller situations – and the emergence of new kinds of programs that are not necessarily college programs. I mean, I'm still personally a, a believer in the value of the college de- college degree, for two-year school, four-year school, if you can do it without putting yourself into sort of an unaffordable debt situation. But I think along the way, if people aren't ready to make that kind of commitment, we need in sort of the ec- in the education ecosystem, there needs to be more programs like like the ones in, uh, your caller talked about in Rhode Island, or states and organizations need to sort of step up with more sort of these interim programs that could eventually maybe lead to a college degree at some point. Because some of these programs could, because they don't necessarily teach all the, you know, the broader skills, they can, they can be useful for a period of time, but they, we don't want them to become a dead end for people. So the best versions of these programs are ones that lead to a certificate of some value in the market that people will recognize and that might eventually be able to nest into a, an associate's degree or some other degree down the line. Mm. Brian's calling from Fairfield. Brian, you're on Where We Live. Go ahead. I uh, think that there's a big emphasis on the academic aspects uh, right now, and I think that a lot of young people would benefit from focusing a little bit more on the trades. Uh, I see an aging workforce in the trades, for instance, HVAC, electrical, um, and even engineering. And uh, the other and thing that you can gain from going into a trade is you can effectively have an apprenticeship program where you can be paid for your training. And I think it's something young people should consider. That's 
all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, uh, for your comment. Uh, Goldie, we're seeing that on the eastern side of our state where there are community colleges and state colleges that are trying to pair up with some of our uh, defense uh, industries looking to train them on these very specialized trades as well. Yeah, I, I, mean, and I just did a big report on the sort of the what's the nature of the skills gap? Does it really exist? And one of the places where the skills gap seems very hard and real is in fields like advanced manufacturing and things like that, where there are literally um, millions of jobs right now that companies can't hire for, in part because, as the caller said, um, people are sort of aging out of, that, out of those careers, and it's, it's not been as attractive a market for younger people. It, it doesn't get as emphasized. As, I, I didn't actually believe this that much at first when people were saying it, but there, you know, I, now I'm starting to accept, understand that even in schools right now, these trades don't get talked about as much in the K-12 system, and so younger people are not being sort of exposed to those careers mm-hmm. early on, and they don't they don't necessarily see them as a viable option. And that's probably something that's got to colleges and schools need to better understand what's involved in an advanced manufacturing career or other kinds of what they call these like soft skilled jobs that are frankly going to be the important rising jobs in our economy as automation kind of eliminates more of the more rote careers that are out there. Mm-hmm. Goldie, we just have a couple of minutes left, but again, you've uh, looked at this uh, this question for some time in your reporting. Uh, nationally, uh, there are pockets uh, that of schools that are looking to uh, bring more technical skills to the liberal arts programs, but uh, still, uh, still uh, very few compared to a lot of the programs that still exist in our country. I mean, it's hard to quantify four thousand colleges, but I mean, so what I hear about are the places that are taking action, and I'm sort of impressed by the, the the way the schools that are acting, I've been impressed by the way they've been doing it. Um, a, a, several places that have looked at making these sort of data science minors, what, what they do is they survey their community and they discover that there are certain foundational skills that, you know, whether it's engineering or biomedical or finance, there's some basic digital skills that all these fields want. And so some of the schools that have been creating these data science minors or data science programs in their schools they're, they're not doing it to turn students into, like, fi- just to make everybody into a finance major or something like that. They're recognizing, though, how something like, a, you know, data proficiency is be- and digital proficiency is becoming a, almost a liberal art. And they're adding that to the curriculum across the board in a way that I think does reflect where we're heading. Mm. Uh, we don't have time to take uh, uh, the next call, but John from Kensington uh, did tell our call screener that uh, he grew up in New Britain with had a rich uh, factory uh, history, and uh, we, moving forward as a country, have to be careful when we're training the next generation to make sure we're not training them for our grandfather's jobs, um, because you have uh, towns and cities that uh, when industry leaves, uh, people are left uh, with uh, you know not a lot of job and economic opportunity, and that's something that still needs to be addressed. He's, yeah, that's true. That's always the danger in this, right? You train people for the job of today or the job of yesterday, and com- companies pick up and move, and then suddenly you're, you've left the workforce behind. Well, Goldie Blumenstick is senior writer for the Chronicle of Higher Education, author of American Higher Education in Crisis, What Everyone Needs to Know. Goldie, thank you for your time. We hope to have you back. Thank you, Lucy. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Uh, today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Katie Tolarski was our technical producer today. Lydia Brown on the phones. Again, thanks for listening.